السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah, I love seeing young faces and old faces too. Young faces in the masjid, amazing. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We continue from where we left off last week. We're talking about Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And this is part, uh, what is it, part five? Part five. Good. You're listening, alhamdulillah. Part five of the Prophet, the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. So we're going to some detail. Last week, the last part, well, I said it a bit quick. So I'll just go over it a little bit more today so that there is a there's smoothness in the sequence, inshallah. So we reached the part where Pharaoh drowned. We all know that famous story about him drowning in the Red Sea, don't you? This story is very famous in the Torah, in the Bible as well, and in the Quran. Very quickly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he had sent to Fir'aun, Haman, who was his right-hand man, his soldiers, and all the people of Egypt, the Copts, he sent them nine signs. And each time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him these signs, they would... Um, each time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him these signs, Each time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him these signs, they would promise that they will be better, they'll believe in Allah, and they will release the children of Israel. But when the signs were taken away, they waited a little while, a few months, and then Allah says they would return back, breaking their promise again. Again, This is in the Qur'an. This is in the Qur'an, what I just said. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he sent them, this is the order I think, the snake, the staff of Musa alayhi salam was the first sign to Pharaoh and his people. But instead of giving in and working with Musa alayhi salam, they worked against him. They called him a magician. We went through the story of the magicians. Then the hand, Musa alayhi salam was dark in feature. He was dark and he would place his hand inside release it and it would be white without any blemish then Allah sent upon them the drought the whole Nile River became there was a drought became dry they couldn't grow their crops from it drought and famine then the produce was dead fruits wouldn't come out crops wouldn't grow grains wouldn't grow then the flood the Nile River started to flood then the locusts they look like grasshoppers the big Bigger than grasshoppers. They eat everything alive. Every, all the crops. They eat all their food. And then the lice. Lice went into the hair of everybody. Diseases. Then the frogs. Millions of frogs everywhere they went. And then the blood. The Nile River turned into blood. This is all in Surah Al-A'raf. If you want to have a look at it. After all these signs. And everything was clear to the people of Pharaoh. Only a very small number of them followed Musa alayhi salam. Now the Quran doesn't tell us how many. The Quran says that after the magicians thing happened, only people from the children of Israel believed in Musa alayhi salam's message and Harun. And they kept it a secret. They made little signs on their doors and on their houses where they would know each other. And they would pray in little groups in each house in secret. Because Pharaoh was killing anyone who was following Musa salam or torturing them. And only a number of the Egyptians embraced Islam. The Quran talks only about one of them. He is a very important man. Till today the Quran talks about this man. We don't know his name. But what he did is a great lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Fir'aun gathered 
his people, his high-ranked people one day. And he said to them, وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ ذَرُونِي أَقْتُلْ مُوسَى Fir'aun said, let me kill Moses. وَلْيَدْعُ رَبَّهُ And let him call upon his Lord. إِنِّي أَخَافُ أَنْ يُبَدِّلَ دِينَكُمْ I fear that he is going to change your religion. أَوْ أَنْ يُظْهِرَ فِي الْأَرْضِ الْفَسَادِ Or he's going to spread corruption in the land. This is who? Pharaoh. <laughs> the disbeliever, him. He's the one that's saying words that almost sound like virtuous. Why is he saying that? He's saying, let me kill Moses, as if they're not letting him kill him. Why won't they let him kill him? There were people among his people that had secretly embraced Islam, and some of them were in doubt. The words of Moses were affecting them. So it's as though people were against him in killing him. But really, nobody dared to say to Pharaoh, don't kill him. Pharaoh himself made that up. Why? Because Pharaoh, he was afraid of killing him himself. He had doubt. But he used it as an excuse. He's got to look after his own pride as a king. And he said, let him call upon his Lord. Meaning, as I'm killing him, he'll call upon his Lord. And when his Lord doesn't respond, everybody will, will think that he's a liar. And then he said, I fear that he will change your religion. Pharaoh does not fear anything. He doesn't fear changing the religion. But I'll tell you something. These are one of the traits of a dictator. Even till today, this is the same trait. In fact, I don't think there's any real fair ruler today, even if they call themselves democratic rulers. They're a little bit... They can't get away with as much as what a dictator can get away with, but they all use the same means, almost like a dictatorship. If, if, they don't, if they're not open dictators, they'll use manipulation. They'll try to make something that people can hold on to them, like their nationality, or they'll make up a religion. Pharaoh made up his own religion, sort of. In fact, he was called the son of a god. Scientists say that he had red hair. The son of the, the, the noon sun. And that he was almost godly to them. He said, I, I don't know any other lord but me. And Pharaoh said, he's going to change your religion. The original religion of the people of Egypt was Yusuf salam's religion. And they forgot that they had changed the religion and made people worship idols. But you see, he turned it into a religious thing because that's also authority and power. Have you ever heard of Henry IV? Henry III. In Brit Henry III, the Romans. So the Byzantines. Henry III, he had a dispute with the Pope, with the Pope in the time, the Catholic Pope. He wanted to divorce his wife and the Pope said, you're not allowed. So then Henry III made up his own church. He called it the Church of England. And he became the supreme authority of it. And he annulled his marriage according to his own laws. And so the Church of England came out till today. That's how it was made. People wanting power and authority and dictatorship, they make up their own religion. Who cares? And that's what Pharaoh did. I fear that he's going to change your religion. Meaning, but what he's trying to say is, I fear that he's going to take over my kingdom. That's what he's trying to say. Now, boys and girls, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, Pharaoh was one of those dictators. Now, in the, um, among them, there was a man whom Allah says, وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِّنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانًا And the man from the family of Pharaoh, he was hiding his religion, his iman. He tried to talk to them as if he's on their side. He said, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ do you want to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah? He brought you clear signs, as you can see, all these signs, the nine miracles that he showed you. Because they believed in God, they believed in Allah, but they made partners with him. And he kept on talking eloquent speech with them, showing them that I care about you, he says. And then he said an important statement. He said, If he is a liar, if Fir'aun is, a, if Musa is a liar, then let him be. His lie is going to expose him. Because we all know that lies don't last. If he's a liar, His lie will expose him. Let him go. The problem is that if he is truthful, that's where the calamity lies. Is where the musibah is. 
وَإِنْ يَكُوا صَادِقًا يُصِبْكُمْ بَعْضُ الَّذِي يَعِدُكُمْ A bit of his truth, you will share it too. You'll be prosperous. So you got nothing to lose. Just go with him. Leave him alone. Don't kill him. Obviously, this guy is a mu'min. Pharaoh, he responds. He says, مَا أُرِيكُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَرَى <laughs> No, I don't see any other way but my way. وَمَا أَهْدِيكُمْ إِلَّا سَبِيلَ الرَّشَادِ And I'm just guiding it to the right path. That's all he said. Dictators, oppressors is what they say. So it's only my way or the highway. You're either with me or against me. And I want to take it to salvation. But there's no substance to it. So the man kept on going. He kept on saying to them, look at what happened to the people of so-and-so, Ad and Thamud and the people before you. They knew their stories. And then suddenly he declares his iman. He tells them there is only one God and there is you know, Jannah. And he starts to give them da'wah. And this story of this man in the Qur'an, Allah mentions him because he stood up against the tyrant and he spoke the truth. There are times when you should stay silent because it will cause more harm to speak. But then there comes a time when there is no more room to remain silent. You have to speak up against tyranny, no matter where you are. Whether you are at work, in your family, at school, with your friends, right? If you are in power or no power, wherever you are, you're a person of truth, inshallah. Where you see you should speak up, then you should speak up. So long as you speak the truth, not, not with the wrong intentions. Not just a keyboard warrior, for example. You need to speak with truth, with true sincerity, and you need to be very careful and investigate what you're talking about. But there comes a time when a person needs to speak up for the truth. And Allah mentions this man in the Qur'an till the end of time. Now he said, Oh Allah, save me from them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved this man from Pharaoh and his people. He ran away at night and went and followed Musa alayhi salam. When they reached the Red Sea, this man, he was on his horse. He used to say to Musa, Ya Musa, is this the place where your Lord promised you? Is this the place where you're He was so excited. But he's from the people of Pharaoh. And he was one of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran among the righteous and Allah saved him from the clenches of the oppressors. My brothers and sisters in Islam, and so Musa alayhi salam hit the Red Sea with his stick and Allah says the ocean opened up, the sea opened up. Allah says, فَلَمَّا تَرَى الجمعان. And when the groups came face to face, Pharaoh's group and the children of Israel, قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ The companions of Moses cried out, the children of Israel, We are overtaken, they're going to get us. Remember what we said about the children of Israel that time? They were impatient. They could never easily trust someone. They were disobedient. And they were slow learners and stubborn. After all these signs and what Allah showed them, they're on their side. He says, they still told Musa, they're going to get us, Ya Musa, they're going to get us. Even beforehand, they said, we were tortured before you came and we were tortured after you came. And then he reminded them and they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at the sea, they said, he's going to get us, Ya Moses. You know, is this really what your Lord promised you? They're doubting. They're doubting what Allah said. And from here on, there's going to be a lot of lessons for us, brothers and sisters, from what the children of Israel used to do. Doubting, being put to the test of your faith. How do you stand? Allah says, قَالَ كَلَّا Musa said, no, certainly not. My Lord is with me. He will direct me. Then we reveal to Musa, commanding him, strike the sea with your rod. Thereupon the sea split up and then each became like the mass of a huge amount, like big mountains. And they set through it. The children of Israel passed and the people of Pharaoh followed them until all his soldiers they entered with him and he entered last and then Allah ordered the sea to crush them. Every single one of them drowned and died, including Mus, including Fir'aun. As Fir'aun was drowning, he then said, Oh Allah, he said, I believe in the Lord of the children of Israel now. In another verse, he said, 
حتى إذا أدركه الغرق قال آمنت أنه لا إله إلا الذي آمنت به بنو إسرائيل وأنا من المسلمين. He started saying in the water, I believe that there is no God but Allah in whom the children of Israel believe, and I am also one of those who submit to Allah. But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reply? He said, Al-ana wa qad asayta min qablu wa kunta min al-mufsideen. Thereupon came the response. Now you believe, although you disobeyed earlier and were among the mischief makers. What does this mean? It means that there are three situations a person's repentance cannot be accepted. Number one, when the sun rises from the west, signs of the last hour. Number two, when the soul reaches the gargling point. And number three, when Allah has promised the punishment upon a people of a prophet, and when it arrives, there's no more repentance. Pharaoh knew this, so he was deliberate in what he did. He tried to get out of it. Allah says, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't plan and plot your repentance. Jibreel alayhi salam says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this authentic hadith in Tirmidhi, he said, O oh Muhammad, if only you could see me when Pharaoh was drowning. I, used, I went down to the bottom of the seafloor and I got some clay and soil and I was shoving it into his mouth, fearing that Allah's mercy will reach Pharaoh. In another narration, he says, I put soil into his mouth, fearing that he will say, La ilaha illallah. Now, there's a bit of commentary about that. And to be honest, I don't have the full commentary on it. It's very difficult. There are one or two scholars who told us that this is not authentic in the past, but the majority say it is. And the explanation is not clear about it. However, Fir'aun did not say, La ilaha illallah. He said, there is no God but the God of the children of Israel. So, in fact, he didn't know which God is talking about. He just said, whatever that God is, I believe in him. So he believed without really knowing. And we all know the condition of La ilaha illallah. What is it? The condition is you must say it knowing what it means and believing in it. Which God are you talking about then? La ilaha illallah. No God worthy of worship except Allah. It could mean anything. So one of the commentaries say, he said, I believe in the Lord of the children of Israel. But he didn't know which Lord it is. So it wasn't a proper shahada. He didn't convert. As for Jibreel alayhi salam, putting the soil into his mouth, saying I was fearing Allah's mercy coming. The ulama said he was commanded by Allah to come and put the soil into his mouth. But Jibreel, because he hated Pharaoh so much, he did not deserve Allah's mercy. He said, I shoved it in his mouth just to make a statement that Allah does not give him his mercy. And then other scholars, they said, no, Allah's mercy couldn't, could have even reached Pharaoh. But that's a weak statement. The bottom line is, brothers and sisters, I can't explain it fully. All I know is that the story is there. It's an authentic hadith. And this is what Jibreel did. And we know that Allah's mercy is very, very huge. It's, it's wide. The point is Allah did not accept Pharaoh's repentance and he could not convert. And it was written upon him that he will die a disbeliever, a kafir. But instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ Allah said, We shall now save your corpse, we'll save your body, that you may serve as a sign for those who come after you, although many people are heedless of our sign. So instead, the words that Pharaoh said were only enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take his body, save it out of the ocean. But there was only one reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved his body out of the ocean. He saved it so that... The children of Israel, who wanted Pharaoh dead, and his people who thought of him as this huge thing that will never die, Allah said, we will make you a sign for those who come after you. By showing them that you truly died under the hands of the same God you denied. Because it was quite open. And that later on destroyed the religion of the Pharaohs and the Egyptians and only a but only lasted for a couple of hundred years and then it went. Now, here is something I need to co comment about. As we grew up, we used to read those books about finding Pharaoh's mummy. And that it's now in the, in the Egyptian museum. 
and we see the most uh, preserved mummy, who was called Ramses II. Any, anyone heard of that? You've seen it on the internet, on YouTube. The most preserved mummy. He's Ramses II. And there's this book uh, by Dr. Maurice Bucail, a French uh, uh, surgeon, who had the privilege of, of uh, studying the mummies that were taken to France to see what, the, what their cause of death and so on with all the other forensic scientists. Now, he converted to Islam, this doctor, and he wrote a book, Science and the Bible, or Science and Islam and the Quran. And he wrote that uh, Pharaoh, this one, Ramses II, he said, I found salt in his body which shows that he died in the Red Sea. And it went around, it spread. Now, this is the only person in the world who said something like this. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, there's no reason for science to hide this. And they've denied it. I personally don't believe it, even if he said it. And uh, I don't believe that it is a miracle, that's, that this was the miracle of the Qur'an. I don't, I don't believe that it is permissible for us to say, actually, not even permissible to say, that Allah's miracle in Pharaoh is that he left his body till the end of time. That's what a lot of Muslims believe these days. And I believe this is ignorance. Because nowhere in the Quran did Allah say, I'm going to preserve your body till the end of time. And the word khalfaka, those who come after you, means a lot of things. In fact, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, this is also in Tafsir ibn Kathir, he says that you shall remain a sign for those who come after you, meaning a sign for the children of Israel. Abdullah ibn Abbas says, you are a sign for the children of Israel, meaning as a sign that you truly have died and Allah gave them victory over you. And a sign for the, your own people so that they can stop putting their trust in you and know that there is only one God, Allah. But it doesn't mean that his body was going to last forever. Because if that's the case, then he, he disappeared. For over, what, only, only recently they discovered um, the pharaohs, in the 1800s. And there were many of them. But that particular pharaoh, 1888 or 81, they discovered him, Ramses II. So I believe that when you believe these things, you're actually discrediting the Islamic beliefs and making us look a little bit silly. All right? We don't know if that's Ramses II. We don't even know if pharaoh's body lasted till today. It vanished for over 2,000 years. Where was it for 2,000 years? What about all the other Muslims, all the other people? Why didn't they see Pharaoh's body? So my brothers and sisters, if it happens to be the body of Pharaoh that the Quran talks about, then all it indicates is one thing. It indicates that Allah saved him from the ocean. That's it. It doesn't mean that the miracle lasts and we say, look, the Quran is true. We don't need this stuff to prove the Quran true. Don't need to hold on to like a, dry, a, 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 a drowning person who are trying to hold on onto a straw to save himself. That's what, we, that's what we seem like now. It's as if we're shoving it down people's throats to believe it. Yes, this is the Pharaoh which the Quran talks about whether you like it or not. I'm not even sure, right? But I want to shove it down people's throats as if I have a doubt about my religion. So my dear brothers and sisters, be very careful to just take information from anywhere we hear it and then run with it. Allahu alam if that is Pharaoh or not. We don't know. Allah said, we will leave you as a sign for those who are after you. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, the children of Israel and also his people for a short while. That the reign of Pharaoh was over. My brothers and sisters in Islam, what happens next? Banu Israel. Now we go to the second part of the story of Musa alayhi salam. This is probably even more important or as equally as important as the story of Pharaoh. So did I tell you that they saved Pharaoh's body came out of the ocean and then they mummified it? That's what happened. Okay. Banu Israel were going to be made victorious above the Pharaohs. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala noted to them that it all depends on how they are afterwards. If they continue obeying Allah and staying by His side, they'll remain victorious. But once they corrupt, they will lose their kingdom. And no nation or person stays in power forever. Allah said, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Straight after the, this story, Allah says, And such are the days. We make them turn around. Power is taken away from some people, given to other people. So He's addressing the children of Israel that they're not going to remain in power forever. It depends on how they are afterwards. As though Allah knows what they're going to do. 
As they crossed the Red Sea, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's first message to the children of Israel with Musa. There were about 700,000 of them standing with Musa alayhi salam on the east side of the Red Sea. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O children of Israel, as you saw now, we saved you from Pharaoh and from the torture. And now we are making an appointment with you. Allah said to Musa alayhi salam, Tell, take the children of Israel to Mount Tur. Mount Tur is in the Sinai Peninsula, close to Palestine. He said, take them there. Over there, there's going to be a covenant between them and Allah, an agreement, a promise. Allah was going to give Musa alayhi salam the Torah. The Torah, the Bible of the Jews. Bible means holy book. We're going to give him the Torah and Allah is going to make a covenant with the children of Israel, a promise that they will follow whatever commandments are in the Torah. Now, obviously, Torah over there wasn't revealed to all all at once. Over the years, it was revealed like similar to the Quran. But the first commandments were going to be revealed at Jabal al-Tur. Now, we're not sure if the same commandments that exist in the Bible, but we believe in all those commandments. But a, a large number of commandments and prohibitions were going to be revealed as part of the Torah at Jabal al tur the Mount of Tur. So they headed off towards that place. As they were heading, they got hungry. They got tired. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon them something amazing. He started making the clouds rain upon them a special substance. The special substance in the Quran was called man or manna. Manna, I don't know what it is exactly. It was sweet. And they can make out of it several things. They can make dough. They can make something that looked like rice. They could make all sorts of things out of it. Several ingredients. And they could dry it and it lasted for a while. Also, Allah started sending upon them salwa. Salwa is a type of bird. In the Bible it says quail. But salwa in the Qur'an is a bit different to a quail. Every day, twice a day, in the morning and the evening, as, as is stated in the Qur'an, these birds would come to them very peacefully. They'd offer themselves, they'd pick them up, and they would eat them. They'd slaughter them and eat them. SubhanAllah. And each time these birds had different tastes, right? Each bird has a different taste to the other. depends on what it's eating. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them luxury, food, looked after them in every way. Now, with the children of Israel, they also had some of the jewelry from the people of Pharaoh as well. How did they have the jewelry? Well, we don't know from the Quran and Sunnah, but in the Israelite tradition, it says that they used to borrow it from their neighbors. And so they took it with them. They were wearing it and it was heavy. So it was cursed material, but they had it on for a little while. On their way, brothers and sisters, as they were going to Jabal al tur they passed by a tribe. And they found that this tribe were worshipping different statues, idols. So the children of Israel said to Musa alayhi salam and Harun, اِجْعَلْ لَنَا آلِهَةً كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَةً O oh Musa, why don't you make for us idols? The same as they have idols that they worship. We hang our stuff on it, we worship it. After all this, They forgot because they're still used to shirk. They said, make us gods like they have gods. There's a beautiful hadith which uh, is in in, uh, Imam Ahmad and Tirmidhi where the Prophet Muhammad was on his way to one of the battles and on his way from Mecca to Hunayn they were going. They passed by a people who had a tree a cedar tree. And they used to hang their stuff on it to bless it, bless their weapons and things. So the companions, the sahabas of Muhammad وسلم, said, Ya Rasulullah, ij'al lana dhatu anwat kama lahum dhatu anwat. A messenger of Allah, make for us a tree like this or some kind of image that, that we can use to hang our stuff on it as they have. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became angry and sorrowful saying, Allahu Akbar, Wallahi, you said exactly what the children of Israel said to Musa. Give, make us gods the way they have gods to worship them. Subhanallah. And that particular tree 
was made to be forgotten by the companions. The Sahabas used to say, None, no two people, no two, two people among us could identify which tree it was. Like if you get two people, one would say, no, I think it's this tree. The other one would say, I think it was that tree. And Ibn Hajar, the great scholar in our history, he says, this was a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah hid which tree it was in case people took it as a deity to worship. Have you ever heard of knock on wood? When somebody sees something they're impressed about, right? And some people still do it. It surprises me how some Muslims do it today. It says they knock on wood. It's like so that they don't jinx me. They don't give me the eye. They don't. This, my dear brothers, knock on wood has an ancient tradition. They used to believe that souls of righteous people used to go into these trees and they became holy. And realize that the Prophet ﷺ said, you said what the children of Israel said to Moses, make us gods like they have gods. Even though the companions didn't ask for a god, they just said anwat, meaning give us like a tree that we can hang our stuff on for good luck. Yet the Prophet ﷺ called it a god. God. Anything that you, that we, that anyone associates, puts an attribute, a description, an act upon it that only Allah can have, you've made it a god. There's minor shirk and major shirk, of course. I'll give you an example. The blue eye that some people wear as an amulet, they think that it keeps away the eye, evil eye. Some people wear a horseshoe, put it on their car. They sell it in the shops. There's all sorts of things. Rabbit foot, I don't know what else. Even the little, those little sewn up pieces of leather. You go to some people, they call themselves, well look, this, I have to be fair. Some of this leather which is sewn up is just purely Qur'an. And some sheikhs, they believe in that. But uh, I follow the other opinion that it benefits you nothing. If you write Qur'an on something, and then, and, then you, and then you sew it up and you tell the person to wear it, it'll protect you. To me, that's like buying Panadol from pharmacy and then wearing the packet around your neck. It's not going to get rid of your headache. So the Qur'an was sent down recited. Not to be worn around the neck. For little children, Rasul put it on Hassan and Hussein, that's okay. But because they can't read. But generally you used to read upon them and you read upon yourself. But then there's this other one, they sew it up and they put uh, talismans in there and words of sorcery, and I don't know what. And this is shirk. So when, when we put our trust in an object or something that only Allah can protect us from, then we've made some kind of shirk there. It's amazing in the 21st century and people believe, uh, they don't believe in a God, but they believe in astrology and star signs. It's amazing, Allah. Anyway, so these people, they said that. And Musa, alayhi salam, he got angry at them saying, you, look what you've just seen, look what Allah has given you, look what Allah has done, and you're already going to make partners with Allah. Repent to Allah. So then they repented. On their way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. Again, they were still new, out of slavery and out of a long time of not knowing who they are. So Allah forgave them. On their way, Musa salam did something strange. Out of his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he decided to hurry, beat them to the Mount Tur and, leave, and tell them to follow him later on. He left his brother Harun salam and said to him, Ya Harun, Stay back with the people because they're a bit slow. You look after them and I entrust you with them. And follow me with them. I'm going to beat you to Mount Atur because I want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speak to him so that he can be pleased with me. That's Musa salam's own judgment. When Musa salam reached Jabal Atur and the children of Israel stayed behind with Harun, he reached him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَىٰ Allah spoke to Musa salam directly. No wahi, no angel came between him and Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَىٰ تَكْلِيمَ And Allah spoke to Moses many times. Taklima means over and over again. Directly. He said to him, What made you hurry up, ya Musa, and beat your people to me? Musa salam replied, هُمْ أُولَاءِ عَلَىٰ أَثَرِي my Lord, they are following me. They're coming. You know, I've looked after them. They'll be here soon. وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّ لِتَرْضَى Oh my Lord, I hurried up because I just wanted to please you. And I want to be, on, I want to be early. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something happened and afterwards he tells him, We have allowed a test, a sifting to happen with your people. The samurai guy, the guy from samurai, he has misguided them. Something terrible has happened behind you. In other words, Ya Musa, all right, you wanted to please me? But you shouldn't have done that really. Wasn't very wise. They've stuffed up over there. Something's happened. Now Allah says in the Quran, We made an appointment with Moses to come to us to spend 30 nights with him. Allah was going to teach him the Torah for 30 nights. How many nights? 30. But then Musa alayhi salam realized he was fasting. When he met Allah, he would fast in the day. He felt that his breath wasn't pleasant because of the fasting. So he started to eat leaves from trees to change the breath. Again, why? Because he's speaking to Allah. He wants his breath to smell nice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, why did you... This is in the hadith, by the way. It's not in the Quran. He says, why did you break your fast? He said, my Lord, to please you. And Allah said to him, didn't you know that the breath of a fasting person is more beloved to me than the smell of, fra- of the fragrance of musk? And this is from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu as well. You have to stay another 10 days. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says this in the Quran. He says, فَتَمَّ مِقَاتُ رَبَّهُ رَبُّهُ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَ He ended up staying for 40 nights. That extra 10 days made the children of Israel think that Moses had left him. They, he ran away. So a group of them got together and they said, he left us. He said to us, going to be back 30 days. And he's not back anyway. But in the meantime, they had already been worshipping a statue. We'll get back to that, inshallah, maybe next week. But for now, I want to finish it off with this. As Musa alayhi salam was in the tour, he knew something's wrong with his people. And he had to stay an extra 10 days. The children of Israel didn't follow him. But he stayed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving him the Torah. Allah was giving him the Torah written on planks of rock. They were big, flat planks of rock. And they were being carved into the rock. This is also in the Quran that they were on the alwah. They were on bricks of planks like that. As this was happening, and Allah is speaking to Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, he couldn't help himself. What did he say? He said, "Qala uh, Rabbi." He said, "My Lord, alini anzur ilayk. Allow me to look at you. I want to see you." Obviously, Allah is speaking to him. You want to see him after that. Isn't that right? If you spoke speaking to someone far distance, you've never seen them before and you like how they talk, and one day you want to meet them. So he said, My Lord, let me look at you. Allah replied, You are not able to see me. Allah didn't say, I won't let you see me. He said, you are not able to see me. As if to say, I would have shown you myself, but you're not able. How come he's not able? He's not able because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in this world for a purpose. And the way he created us was weak to serve the purpose and then return to him. While we are in our physical state now, we cannot see Allah. Otherwise, it'll burn everything in sight. Everything will become gone into ashes, into nothing actually, obliterated. That's not hard to believe because scientists have discovered the black hole, for example. The size of a 10 cent coin black hole, if it came close to earth within um, 10 kilometers, it'll destroy much of the earth, the black hole, if you've ever heard of it. There's other things in heaven, in the space that even if it's the size of an atom, it got too close to earth, it can destroy everything and burn everything, let alone Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah Muhammad said, between Allah and everything else, there is nur. There is light that is covering. If this light were to be removed, 
everything will burn, everything will go and perish. So Allah says to him, you cannot see me. وَلَكِنْ أُنظُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلِ But look at that mountain over there. فَإِنِ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي If the mountain can stay where it is, you will be able to see me. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّى رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ When his Lord showed himself to the mountain. Ibn, Ibn Abbas says that Allah showed a tiny bit of nur, not even himself, nur, light, which was the size of a fingy, pinky finger to the mountain. He made the whole mountain crumble into pieces, little tiny pieces, the entire mountain. And Musa, as a result of seeing this, he went unconscious. He fell to the ground, went unconscious. When Musa السلام, woke up, he said, Subhanaka, oh my Lord, you are perfect. You are far away from imperfection. I have returned to you. Please forgive me for asking you that question. I am the first to believe in you, my Lord. I don't need to see you because I don't believe in you, my Lord. I'm just confirming I believe in you, my Lord. I don't need to see you. Now, will we ever see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is yes, definitely. In the Quran, Allah says it indirectly and directly. Directly, in Surah Al Qiyamah, Allah says, On that day, faces will be bright and shining, looking at its Lord. And there is authentic hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim.